as our world becomes more and more connected, you'll start to see that stories and storytellers have access to a much larger range of an audience and of a potential viewership than they have previously in the past. A predictable result of this is that the larger the fan base, the higher the risk that there will be that your story will be criticized, both fairly and unfairly. Oftentimes, whenever a show, book, movie, or any other kind of medium that tells a story starts to gain recognition, and it starts to elevate in its status, there is an elevated risk for criticism. And that criticism can either be fair or unfair, true or untrue, or shall we say, valid or invalid. On the flip side, however, you start to see the same to be true on the other side as well. For example, when you see a story or any kind of storytelling mechanism that targets a specific demographic especially, you start to see that there are people or fans that start to latch onto the story that aren't able to really objectively look at the show or movie or book. Fans often will become overly connected with certain aspects of the show or its characters, and this makes it impossible for them to actually objectively see what the show is and whether or not the show is any good. Often how this manifests itself is that you'll see fans of the show who only see what they want to see, only the good aspects, only the good things about the show that they remember. And oftentimes it can also manifest in the fans not being able to see anything about the show that's negative, like problems with the internal logic of the show, problems with the characters, their underlying motives, or problems with the actual plot and how it moves and how it's paced. It's important for fans as a baseline not to be like this because number one, it creates toxicity and it creates a fan base that isn't really willing to accept anything else besides the original content that they were given which oftentimes if the storytellers catch on and realize that they can't create anything else, they'll make this show really stale and they'll make it so that the show can't progress, which ends up eventually killing it. Number two is it's just not healthy. It's not healthy for anybody to be invested into something that is so obviously fictional. Stories are commentary on the things that you and I go through every single day. That's all that stories are. They're fictional commentaries on what it is that you and I go through. They're rationalizations of the experiences that you and I have here on earth. And this leads into the third point which is that when fans act like this, fans oftentimes aren't able to distinguish between what is real and what is not real, what is the story and what is not the story. And that's where you start to get some of those weird stories about people stalking each other. Now, each one of us has a show that we are partial to, regardless of the things in the show that should or should not make us like it because they don't make any sense. Every single one of us has a show that we like in spite of what's wrong with it. And there's really nothing wrong with that. That doesn't make you a toxic fan. You see, it's normal for all of us to have reasons that we like shows that outweigh the objective negatives of the show that we're watching. It's normal for all of us to have shows that we cling to, our little hidden vices that we enjoy, or those little books that we will keep reading no matter what they do to us, because there's something about the show that we just inherently love. That's not a problem. What is a problem is when you have a show that you like so much, or a movie that you enjoy so much, or a book that you cannot put down, that your love for the actual story starts to blind yourself to objective things about the story that do not work, internal logics that have no place being there. That's where the danger comes in. The problem isn't in liking the show, regardless of the issues that it has. The problem is in liking a show so much that you're unable to see the issues in the first place. Sora Online fits this description for me personally for a lot of reasons, and one of those reasons is because I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. When I first started watching it, it was because my little brother had been watching it, and I figured I was bored, I needed something to watch, why not this one? And as I watched it, I started to get really into it, and at the time, I had no idea what kind of rabbit hole I was going down into. This show, this anime, is probably one of the most divisive shows that I've ever seen, with clear-cut battle lines drawn between those who love it and those who hate it that are actually really interesting when you start to break them down. Now, full disclosure for you before I break down Sword Art Online. I like SAO, and I like it a lot. My personal opinion of it does not impact whether or not the show is good. Those things are separate issues. I need you to understand that before you watch this video. I like certain aspects of SAO that other people may not, or in spite of what other people see as structural flaws. I see those structural flaws too, and I address them in this video. What I'm attempting to convey is that in spite of those things, I still enjoy the show, but they don't affect what I see as core problems that do occur with the show. And let me tell you, there are problems with the show. And as always, if you haven't gotten there yet, there are spoilers in this video. So if you want a spoiler for your review, go elsewhere because you won't find it here. Problem one that I usually hear with this show is something to do with the main character, Kirito. 
how they don't like him, etc., yada, yada, yada. For the most part, I see three different variations of complaints when it comes to the main character. Complaint number one is usually Kirito is overpowered, or some kind of variation of that. Listen, the answer to this depends on your belief in the suspension of disbelief. Do you think that Kirito could become that powerful over the course of a beta test? If you do, then Kirito having dual wield isn't really all that out there, is it? It's really not all that far-fetched. If you don't think he could be that powerful over the course of a beta, there's your answer. You think he's overpowered, and that's the end of it. To be completely honest with you, I don't think Kirito being as powerful as he is really hurts the story all that much. What I do think it hurts is his relatability to us as a main character. You see, all of us want to be the main character. All of us want to relate to them in some way. That's why it is that we want to root for them. That's also why it's so hard to make a Superman movie. That dude's perfect. That dude's a Boy Scout. That dude doesn't do anything wrong. And so it's really hard to root for Superman. And it's really hard to make a good Superman movie because he's basically God. At the end of the day, I don't think the story really suffers in Kirito being overpowered. I think it suffers because they don't really explain why it is or how it is that Kirito got to the point of being so OP. To me personally, saying it was the beta is really lazy writing and it's just a really easy way to cop out, we made him OP, deal with it. Also, if any of you have actually ever played a video game, you'll understand that just because you're good at an MMO does not mean you'll be good at a first person shooter. As a matter of critical thinking, anybody who's actually ever touched a mouse and keyboard or a controller is going to understand that skills do not translate between games. Being good at Call of Duty does not make you good at Fall Guys, it does not make you good at League of Legends, and it definitely doesn't make you good at CSGO. Even though CSGO and Call of Duty are somewhat comparable games, I know they're not really gamers, but just humor me for the normal people, even though they're somewhat comparable games, having skill in one does not make you good at the other. That's like saying someone who's good at football should be good at basketball, or people who are good at basketball should be good at tennis, or people who are good at tennis should be good at rugby. Those skills do not inherently transfer over. Just because you're good at one does not inherently mean that you'll be able to immediately pick up, master, and be competent with the other. The next complaint usually is something along the lines of Kirito has this undeserved harem of women that just follow him from place to place and just dote on his every single need. And you got me. You hit the bullseye, you won the lottery, you hit 100, I got really nothing to say to that. While Asuna and Kirito's romance actually works really well, and I'll talk about that later, it's kind of weird how easily he's able to charm all these supposedly teenage to adult women to love him and stick around with him, even after they end up exiting the game. It's kind of weird, culty, and it kind of makes you feel uncomfortable at times. And finally, the good old reliable Kirito's an unremarkable and unoriginal character. There's no such thing really as an original character in any real sense of the word. What people are doing is they're taking tropes and they're either subverting expectations or flipping the expectations on their head. And so they're really not creating brand new puzzles so much as they are using the pieces and trying to put them in different places and see if they stick. Personally, I think Kirito has his moments. I think his time with the moonlit black cats, while jaggedly done and oddly paced, I think it's emotional, even if the emotion has to be pried from your cold, dead body. If you want my personal opinion, I think he's a 16 year old boy, and 16 year old boys do not have emotional range and depth, and this makes him really unrelatable to the rest of us, but to anywhere from 12 to 18 year old boys who are usually watching their first animes for the first time, this is all the emotional range they need. Coincidentally, a lot of the people that I see fighting online in defense of SAO are people who saw SAO as one of their first animes, and they usually saw it as a teenager. This being the case, these are the animes that they will most ardently defend without actually putting any thought into the fact that the anime itself is not very structurally sound. And it makes sense. The people who are defending the show are defending a show with a character who is probably around the same age as them or was around the same age as them, and it was the first and most impressionable anime that got them started. They're probably going to defend that thing regardless of what you say, so it's pretty much impossible for you to really change it, and so you should probably leave it alone. Problem number two that often comes up for a lot of people who don't like this show is that the villains suck. Once again, there's really not much that I could say about this even if I did have anything to say. And that's because generally, that assessment is correct. The first villain, and probably the villain with the highest ceiling, was Akihiko Kaiba, the creator of Aincrad, which is where most of the first season of SAO takes place. Aincrad is actually a really good idea, and Akihiko Kaiba had the potential to be a really good villain. That being the case, they end up butchering him in pretty much every single possible way by creating exposition dumps, from having him end too early, from making his motivations basically unknown. There's really nothing that you can draw from anything that he says to create a real motive. Basically making him so unknown that he ends up being bland as a villain. 
The second villain that you encounter is basically just a glorified sex offender. He's basically into Asuna, but he's got a little bit of a Ted Bundy streak. That's all you really need to know about that character. And the third villain that shows up in season two is basically just the stalker from you, the Netflix series. That's all that he is. There's nothing else to him either. I haven't really seen SAO Alicization, so I can't really comment on that aspect of it in terms of villains. But what I can tell you is that the first three villains, at least in my view, are objectively one dimensional or they're so poorly executed and they're such bafflingly head scratch decisions that are made that they really shouldn't have even been there in the first place. There's almost no value to them past, you know, being placeholders until the next villain. And then problem number three is that there's a lot of convenient ex machinas in SAO. I'll attach a video right here explaining what ex machinas are. But basically for the rest of you, ex machinas are just points in which people are saved by plot armor. The writers will the person not to die, even though every single bit of your body is screaming, that person should be dead right now. Just a few examples of this are when Kirito gets saved by Asuna when he's getting poisoned by the Laughing Coughing Gang. When Kirito and Asuna meet Yui, the magical computer generated daughter. When there's random last heaves of strength when people are already dead in the game. When random systems login accesses are given for apparently no reason at all and running into the exact human that you needed to find to find the murderer or gun gal in about 4 minutes flat. SEO struggles a lot with pacing throughout the course of the entire show and a lot of this comes from the fact that the manga handles time jumps much better than the actual show does. In fact, the show is atrocious when it comes to time jumps. The first 5 to 6 episodes are just one disconjointed mess in terms of trying to string together any semblance of how much time has passed from the beginning to the end. There's a massive disconnect and that makes it really hard to tell what's going on from episode to episode. While the individual episode may not be super bad, the entire construction of the plot and the timeline is really just horrifically awful. Now with a lot of these problems laid out and some of them being refuted and others being affirmed, why is it that I still enjoy SAO enough to watch it? Well for a couple different reasons, the first being that I'm still an 8 year old boy mentally and spiritually and so because I'm that way. I really enjoy watching shows wherein people try and stab each other with magic laser swords. And so the visual of people living inside of a video game, which I already play, and then they try and kill each other in actual real life, and the visuals of that, and just the concept of that, awesome. 8 year old me loves it, and is digging in all day. Second, the romance between Asuna and Kirito, in my opinion, works really, really well. Listen, I think there are a lot of things that you can say about Kirito's perceived lack or actual lack of ability to feel anything emotionally outside of blase, I'm a hero and so I'm gonna save the day mode. And I hold the view that Asuna and Kirito's love story actually works fairly well, even though I also hold the parallel belief that if you can't actually drive them to a place that you're trying to take them on a date to, you're not actually dating at all. Asuna is actually surprisingly a very deep character that the show goes out of its way to explore for a really long time, especially in season two. And I think it actually works really well. There are some points in which she doesn't hold up. I got kind of bored with the last storyline with the girl who was sick in the hospital. That being said, I actually thought Asuna was a very sweet character and an actually really good balance to Kirito's always alpha male, I have to go and save the world thing. She was a really good balance to just the human aspects of the show. She was the most human feeling character. I think she also brings out a really good side of Kirito and I also think that she's probably the only one that makes sense in terms of a motive that Gyalfin goes for. A lot of times his motive is really stupid. Asuna as a motive actually works for me. On top of that, I think SAO is actually really good at one thing, pulling emotion out of their audience for very short amounts of time. I'll refer you to the third episode of season one of SAO for a really good example. It's called The Red-Nosed Reindeer. You see, for most of the story, people dying actually isn't that big of a deal in SAO because they're dying by the thousands, and so the number just keeps climbing and it becomes very relative to you throughout the course of the story, so the human death toll doesn't mean a whole lot to you in terms of emotion. But the death of the Moonlit Black Cats, which is the first guild that Kirito actually joins within the game, which is uncommon for him since he's not a guild player, is actually emotionally effective, and I'll tell you why that is. What the writers did is actually low-key cheating, in my opinion, but I'll explain it to you. First, the writers were able to establish that the brand new players, the Moonlit Black Cats guild that Kirito was joining, were very naive and very trusting, whereas Kirito was contrasted as not conniving but very secretive and not very trusting at all, enough to keep a secret from them. Second, it was established that Kirito was much more powerful than them and they did not know this. They were brand new and they had no idea what his actual power level was. They then made the implicit promise that if anything happened to them, it would be as a result of Kirito not being able to protect them. 
Or if things didn't happen to them, it would be because Kirito was the one keeping everything under control and keeping things running smoothly. By doing so, SAO created what I would call a sacrificial lamb. These are characters that are created and or killed simply for the progression and the advancement of the plot in favor of the main character. For example, if any of you have actually read Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck, you'll understand that Lenny, the big ogre-esque kind of stupid character that has to die in order for George to live, he's the sacrificial lamb. In the same way here, the moonlit black cats are not stupid, but very trusting in a way that's not very intelligent. And because they're very trusting, when they're basically screwed over by Kirito and his, let's say, lack of mm, trust, he, they really suffer because of that. And they end up dying to further Kirito's goals or Kirito's progression for the storytelling. Most storytellers are actually very divided on the morality or the ethicalness of using them to advance your story because oftentimes people use them simply to just go ahead and get a cheap emotional hug from the reader that's unearned and really undeserved. I don't enjoy it as much simply because I think it's kind of cheap to use that when your plot has nowhere else to go because you've written yourself into a corner. I think that's on you to get yourself out of that corner instead of murdering someone to go ahead and earn goodwill and sympathy with your audience. I also think most audiences know enough that they can see and hear and tell when they're being lied to by the actual author or storytellers, and so I don't think it actually ends up working very much in the end. I think the relationship between the girl and the moonlit black cats and Kirito actually works really well if you don't put too much thought into it, you don't dwell on it, and you don't think about it for an extended period of time. That really sums up SAO in a nutshell. If you don't think about it too hard, it's kind of cool, and if you don't dwell on it for too long, you don't really understand how structurally the show really fails set itself up as anything more than a collection of really short stories, a couple of which you'll like and most of which you'll actually really hate. Put any real thought into it and it falls apart like a house of cards. But if you don't put any thought into it, it'll keep bringing you back because it pinches you emotionally and you know you kind of like it. At the end of the day, guys, I actually think SAO is half decent. I think it's an okay show that receives more hate simply because of its visibility and I think people aren't really able to see clearly on a lot of things. That being said, I think a lot of the people who do like the show defend it regardless knowing that there are problems with it but not wanting to acknowledge it because that would mean that they're wrong and there's no way you could ever be wrong on the 